Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the physics program at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. In this lecture, we'll discuss chapter 12, and the subject will be tropical weather systems. As a case in point, we'll cover Hurricane Katrina, which in the 28th of August in 2005, it devastated the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and Mississippi. New Orleans experienced catastrophic flooding, and it was the third most intense landfalling U.S. hurricane. There was severe economic loss, but worse than that, it claimed 1,300 lives. New Orleans topography made the city particularly vulnerable, and it occupies a bowl between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain, and much of it is up to 1.8 or 6 meters below sea level. It relies on levees and pumps to keep the water out. When a levee system was breached, the pumps failed, and the city was flooded in a depth of up to 6 meters, or about 20 feet. The residents were warned in advance but thousands did not or could not evacuate. Katrina was followed by Hurricane Rita less than half a month later, and although landfall was well to the west of New Orleans, but floodwaters up to 1.5 meters or 5 feet, deep, um, 5 feet deep spread over parts of the city due to the new breaks in the levees. So what are the conditions are required for the development of tropical cyclones? In this chapter we'll talk about the weather in the tropics, characteristics of tropical cyclones, geographical and seasonal distributions, associated hazards, the life cycle of tropical cyclones, the forecasting efforts, and unsuccessful experiments to modify these storms. So the tropic is the belt between the Tropic of Can Cancer, about 23.5 degrees north, and the Tropic of Capricorn, which is about 23.5 degrees south. And the weather exhibits very li little seasonal variation with uniform high temperatures. In fact, the daily variation is typically greater than the range of monthly mean temperatures over the course of the year. There's no fronts or frontal weather, and the air masses are uniformly warm and humid. There's thunderstorm activity, and these thunderstorms may align in the tropical non-scale clusters. There's more intense cells so tropical squall cell, cell clusters can form that look like middle latitude squall lines. An intertropical conversion zone stimulates thunderstorm activity and follows the sun. So the summer is the rainy season and the winter is the dry season. There's very little horizontal pressure gradient, so isobar analysis is of little value. Streamline analysis is useful instead, and a streamline is a line drawn on a map that is parallel to the wind direction. And this can be used to identify regions of divergence and convergence, such as that associated with an easterly wave. So what is a hurricane? It's an intense cyclone that originates over the tropical ocean waters, usually in late summer to early fall, and has a maximum sustained wind speed of greater than 74 miles per hour 
or 119 kilometers per hour. If we compare it to an extratropical cyclone, we see that these tropical cyclones have no associated fronts or frontal weather due to its origin over uniformly warm and humid conditions. Sea level pressure and steep horizontal air pressure gradients are typically greater than that of an extratropical cyclone. And a hurricane is a much smaller system. And a mature hurricane is a warm core low whose circulation weakens with altitude. An extratropical cyclone is a cold core low whose circulation strengthens with altitude. So there's an eye at the center of the hurricane and it's an almost cloudless sky and subs subsiding air and light winds. And the diameter of the eye can range from 10 to 65 kilometers or 6 to 40 miles. The eye shrinks as the hurricane intensifies. The eye wall that borders the eye of a mature storm, there's a ring of cumulonimbus clouds that produce heavy rain and very strong winds. The most dangerous and potentially most destructive part of the hurricane is the eye wall on the side of the advancing system where the wind blows in the same direction as the storm's forward motion. So in the northern her hemisphere, this occurs on the right side of the hurricane when facing in the direction of the system's forward motion. We can see cloud bands spiral inward towards the, the eye wall and produce heavy convective showers and hurricane force winds. At high altitudes, cirro, cirrus or cirrostratus spirals, clouds spiral outward from the center. So here's the, the characteristics of a hurricane. What we see is that inside the eye we get subsidence. The skies are clear. We could have a high altitude winds that blow over the hurricane. Winds circle into the hurricane and the strongest winds are on the, at the edge of the eye wall. As this hurricane moves, the winds on this side of the hurricane that are moving in the same direction as the motion of the hurricane will be the highest winds because we'll have the speed of the wind turning around the hurricane added to the wind, added to the translational speed of the hurricane. On the other side of the, of the hurricane, we'll have winds blowing in the opposite direction of its motion, and therefore the net effect would be the speed of the winds minus the translational speed of the hurricane. Here we see the eye wall of Hurricane Katrina on the 28th of August 2005 while the storm center was over the Gulf of Mexico. So there are conditions necessary for the formation. First we need relatively high sea surface temperatures. The hurricane gains its energy from the warm water of the, and the high sea surface temperatures. So a sea surface temperature of at least 26.5 degrees C or 80 degrees Fahrenheit through an ocean depth of 45 meters or 150 feet.
This sustains the circulation by the latent heat released when the water vapor evaporates from the ocean surface and is conveyed upward and condenses. These strong tropical cyclone winds can induce an Ekman transport and lead to lower SSTs or sea surface temperatures. The fact that it gets its energy from the warm ocean waters explains why it tends to weaken once it gets over the land and it loses that heat source. Cyclones may intensify over warm core rings and weaken over cold core rings. This high sea surface temperature requirement makes formation seasonal. So most Atlantic hurricanes develop in the late summer and early autumn when the ocean has had time to reach those temperatures. The official season is from the 1st of June to the 30th of November. The peak threat to the U.S. coastline is from mid-August to late October. We also need an adequate Coriolis effect. So if you remember, if you have winds that are moving up towards the pole, the Earth will rotate and this Coriolis effect makes it appear that the wind is bending. So with rare exceptions, the tropical cyclones do not form within five degrees of the equator because the Coriolis effect just is not that strong there. If you remember, the Coriolis effect gets stronger the further you get from the equator, or the further you travel north. There also has to be weak vertical wind shear. If you remember, for the extratropical cyclones, we needed strong vertical wind shear. With weak vertical wind shear, this allows the cluster of cumulonimbus to form. If there was wind shear, these would tear these apart and they wouldn't form. We also need relatively humid air in the mid-troposphere. So here we see the typical cyclone breeding grounds. So they're just north and south of the equator and as they as they move up towards the north they spend they tend to turn and the same thing when they move south. If we look at the frequency of Atlantic Basin tropical storms and hurricanes, we see they peak in late August and early September. The red bars are for hurricanes and the blue bars are for tropical storms and hurricanes. During El Nino, the Atlantic hurricanes are infrequent because of the strong high altitude winds. The strong wind shear is the main reason why hurricanes rarely form off the coasts of South America. The worldwide average of tropical cyclones is about 80 per year. Only about half of those reach hurricane strength. The Western Pacific Ocean is the most active area and about 27 systems each season, only about 17 of which intensify to typhoons. Only hurricanes spawned in the tropical Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico pose a th serious threat to the coastal North America. So the average is about 10.6 named tropical storms 
each year. About six of those become hurricanes. About 2.4 become major hurricanes. And about 2.5 hurricanes strike the U.S. coast each year. 2005 season set a record with about 27 named tropical storms. So this is almost three times the average. Every Atlantic and Gulf Coast state from Texas to Maine has been hit, and Florida is the most hurricane prone, Texas being the second, and Louisiana being the third. The Pacific Coast is rarely hit by a hurricane due to the northeast trade winds. The Hawaiian Islands are sometimes threatened. So if we look at the life cycle of a hurricane, we start with a tropical disturbance. This is an organized cluster of cumulonimbus clouds over a tropical seas that has a surface center of low pressure, usually triggered by the intertropical inter inter conversion zone. This is an easterly wave and it looks like a ripple in the tropical easterlies featuring a weak trough of a low pressure. On one side of, the, of this trough we have convergence and on the other side we have divergence. So this forms east over East Africa and propagates westward and the precursors of about 65 percent of the named Atlantic tropical cyclones. We start with a tropical disturbance and only a small percentage of the convective cloud cust clusters in the tropical Atlantic evolve into a full-blown hurricane. Some of the reasons is the subsidence of air on the east flank of the Bermuda Azores anti-cyclone and the trade winds inversions inhibit deep convection. Also the vertical wind shear is usually too great. The atmospheric conditions that inhibit cyclone formation appear to be associated with the Sahara air layer and this is an elevated mass of dry dusty stable air originating over the Sahara Desert that travels many thousands of kilometers westward over the Atlantic. If conditions favor hurricane development then the surface air pressure falls and a cyclonic circulation develops. Water vapor condenses within the storm. This releases latent heat and the heated air rises. Then we have expansional cooling of the rising air and that triggers more condensation and a release of latent heat. Rising temperatures in the storm's core and divergence of the air aloft trigger a sharp drop in surface air pressure and increased surface convergence. If the favorable conditions persist, then the cycle continues and a tropical disturbance intensifies and its winds strengthen. So we start with a tropical depression. This has a maximum sustained winds reach 23 miles per hour or 37 kilometers per hour or higher. At the, at the point it reaches the tropical storm stage it's given a name and the winds have reached at least 39 miles per hour or 63 kilometers per hour. Once the reach, winds reach 74 miles per hour or higher then it becomes a hurricane. As the storm 
weakens, it's usually downgraded by reversing this classification system. So it starts as a tropical depression, becomes a tropical storm, hits hurricane strength, then normally hits land, at which time it begins to die and it goes back to being a tropical storm and finally a tropical depression. Here shows some of the tropical cyclones trajectories and they're pretty erratic but they initially drift westward and then curve towards the north and northeast when they reach the western Atlantic. But you can see sometimes they turn around and go in the reverse direction. They make loops. So this is one of the reasons that it's so hard to predict these. So once they reach about 30 degrees north, then a hurricane may begin to acquire extratropical characteristics as cold air is drawn into the system and fronts develop. Some hurricanes become fueled by the warm Gulf Stream and may maintain its tropical characteristics far up to the, up the Atlantic coast. And New England has been a target of many of the strong hurricanes. Some of the hazards to hurricanes are heavy rains and inland flooding. So flesh, freshwater flooding was responsible for about 60% of the deaths from 1970 to 1999. There's also strong winds. These are responsible for about 12% of the deaths. Tornadoes can spawn off of the hurricanes. And we also have storm surge, and this cost caused most of the 1,300 fatalities associated with Hurricane Katrina. They remain the most serious potential impacts of a landfall falling hurricane. So we get strong inland flooding, so rains are typically 13 to 25 or 5 to 10 inches of rain and the heavy rain persists as the storm track tracks inland so even though the hurricane begins to die we still get a lot of rain being brought from, up from this hurricane so if we look at Hurricane Agnes in 1972 rains accounted for most of the property damage so if you notice it started to come up the through the Gulf and that's where it became a hurricane it hit land and became a tropical storm very shortly thereafter it became a tropical depression then went out back out to sea becoming a tropical storm and then hit New York and died off and after becoming a tropical depression. So there is devastating floods in the mid-Atlantic region, especially central Pennsylvania, when the heavy rains fell on already saturated grounds and hilly terrain. This image shows the radar determined cumulative rainfall over southeast Texas produced by the remnants of Tropical Storm Allison. And Allison ranks as the most deadly and costly tropical storm to strike the U.S. mainland. As you can imagine, wind is an important hazard in hurricanes and the wind pressure or the force per area caused by the air in motion 
increases as the square of the wind speed. The debris transported by the wind increases damage potential and small but powerful whirlwinds embedded in the hurricane circulation can be responsible for the most severe property damage. So as the winds diminish rapidly among, upon the storm making landfall, but the hurricane over land is no longer in contact with the warm ocean water and it loses its energy source. Also, frictional resistance slows winds and shifts wind direction towards the center, and this causes the storm to fill in and weaken. The system may still produce tornadoes after making landfall, partially due to the strong wind shear between the surface and aloft. Of the hazards, probably the storm surge is the most deadly in the last few hurricanes. So here we can see a dome of ocean water 80 to 160 kilometers or 50 to 100 miles wide that sweeps over the coastline near the hurricane's landfall. This is caused by the strong winds and the low barometric pressure and is likely is most likely on the side of the hurricane with onshore winds. So this is a wind driven waves on top of a dome of water and armed with floating debris are responsible for much of the structural damage. So for instance a tree gets toppled, toppled over and then it gets caught up in this, this uh, huge mass of water and becomes a battering ram and smashes anything in its in its path. So prior to 1970 it was responsible for the majority of the hurricane related fatalities. Awareness, warnings and evacuations have generally been much better since then. From 1970 to 1999 there's there were only about six storm surge deaths and they were and then there was Hurricane Katrina and the death and destruction caused by its storm surge. In 1895 an unnamed hurricane killed an estimated 2,000 and left 20 to 30,000 homeless and all of this was due to the storm surge. And the most deadly U.S. natural disaster was hurricane that hit Galveston, Texas, Texas in the 1900 when 8,000 people perished. If you'd like to see a documentary about this storm, it's known as Isaac Storm. And a lot can be learned from this storm, and sadly, even though 8,000 people had died. It's also Hurricane Camille that produced a 7.3 or 24 foot surge at Pass Christian, Mississippi. In East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, in 1970, storm surge killed 300,000. So what causes this storm surge? Well, it's strong onshore winds combined with the low air pressure. So the air pressure, low air pressure causes the water to rise about 0.5 meters for every 50 millibars or about one foot for every inch of mercury that that drops in pressure. So the storm surge is also superimposed on top of normal tides. So let's say we have a surge of three to six and a half feet 
it can be expected with a weak hurricane, that of a violent hurricane may top 16 feet. So the greatest potential for the storm surge occurs with strong onshore winds and a shallow sloping shoreline during high tide and in a densely populated area lacking coastal buffers. Storm surges are accurately predicted with a numerical model called slosh, which is sea, lake, overland surges from hurricanes. So you notice if we have a normal tide, here's our main sea, main sea level, mean sea level. If our normal tide goes up a meter and we have a storm surge of five meters, now we have a storm, a six meter storm tide coming in. So table 12.1 shows a surfer Simpson hurricane intensity scale and it shows it starts with a category of one where the damage is minimal and goes to a category five where it's, the damage is catastrophic. For one we have a low that's greater than 980 millibars and for five we have a a central pressure that's less than 920 millibars. The wind speeds for one is between 75 and 95 miles per hour and for five it's greater than 155 miles per hour. For one we get a storm surge of four to five feet. For five we get a storm surge of greater than 18 feet. So that's more than three times the height of most of you that are listening. So this provides an estimate for the potential coastal flooding and the property damage from a hurricane landfall. And wind speed is the prim primary determining factor for the hurricane's rate rating. The storm surge is just an estimate and it depends on the underwater topography and other factors in the region of the landfall. Property damage rapid rises rapidly with the rating so 103 to, 100 to 300 times greater damage from a category 4 or 5 than a category 1. So from 1901 to 2004, about 37% of the landfall hurricanes were classified as major. That's a category three or above. Table 12.2 shows the most intense US hurricanes at landfall. And this is based on the lowest central pressure So in 1935, we had the Labor Day Florida Key hurricane, which was a category five and had a pressure, a surface pressure of 892 millibars. As you see during this time, we had three category five hurricanes and two hurricane, category three hurricanes and the rest were, were category four.
Here we see a radar image of Hurricane Andrew. And it's amazing the structure of this and how tight this eye was. So this explains why they're so hard to destroy once they get formed because they have such a strong formation. Here we have listed the 10 deadliest hurricanes. The first one was 8,000 plus deaths and a hurricane that hit Galveston and once again this was known as Isaac Storm. This storm was very sad be because of the deaths and because the scientists thought that there was no way that a hurricane could hit Galveston so the warnings didn't go out till very late and by the time they went out many people could not evacuate In 1928, in Florida, we had 2,500 to, th to 3,000 deaths due to a hurricane. And Katrina, in 2005, we had 1,500 deaths. This figure shows the recent uptrend in the number of intense hurricanes, so category 4 and 5, and the hurricanes worldwide, and even though the overall number of hurricanes worldwide has declined. So most of this increase in frequency occurred in the North Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, with only a small increase in North Atlantic hurricanes. If we look at the North Atlantic hurricanes, it's the only region of the globe where all the tropical cyclone activity has increased recently. And there are several contributing factors. We've had higher sea surface temperatures in the tropic, tropical Atlantic, and this is related to the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. We also had an amplification ridge over the central and eastern North Atlantic. And we had vertical, we had weaker vertical wind shear in the deep tropics over the central North Atlantic. And we've also had a favorable Atlantic easterly jet stream. So when we put all these things together, this tends to support and increased in cyclone activity. If we look to the southeast, the infrequency in major hurricanes during the 70s and 80s have lulled many coastal residents of the southeast United States into a false sense of security, and it's encouraged coastal development and growth. So in 2005, NOAA reported that the coast is home to 53% of all Americans. The population growth is most rapid from Texas through the Carolinas, especially in Florida. So public safety officials are concerned about this trend as and the trend towards more Atlantic tropical cyclones. The hurricanes are great threats or a strong threat to Florida of course and we see the track of three of the four hurricanes that struck Florida in 2004 and they pretty much ripped right across the central Florida the center of Florida. Barrier islands are of course of particular risk. And most of you know what a barrier island is living near Atlantic City. 
What we have is a barrier island is an elongated narrow accumulation of sand that's oriented parallel to the coast and separated from the ma mainland by a lagoon, estuary, or a bay. So this is a constantly changing system. So sea waves dissipate their energy by shifting the sands and modifying the shape of the island. So gradually they migrate towards the mainland. And in the face of the open water and they absorb the brunt of the ocean storms. So cities such as Atlantic City, New Jersey, um, Miami Beach, Florida, Virginia Beach, Virginia are built entirely on barrier islands. The photographs show a barrier island at Pine Beach, Florida before and after a hurricane and this was Hurricane Ivan. Evacuation becomes critical here as well as in other coastal areas. So it's important that when you're asked to evacuate, you evacuate as, as, as quickly and as safely as you can. The effectiveness of coastal evacuation plan was tested in 1985 when a Category 3 Hurricane Elena followed an erratic path over the Gulf of Mexico. So you can imagine this was a problem whenever hurricanes start doing something like this because you try to get the support people and the rescue teams near enough to the hurricane where it's going to make landfall. But here it looked like it was going to smack right into Florida and suddenly it turned around and headed in the opposite direction. And this was within about a 24 hour period. So the potential downside of the evacuation was illustrated with Hurricane Floyd in 1999 and here we had a large hurricane approaching the southeast and two million people were evacuated and a massive gridlock occurred. So the greater the uncertainty with the forecast track translate into a broader evacuation zone and a greater economic loss. So the cost of amount of evacuations amount to about one million dollars per mile of coastline. So other strategies to, to minimize loss of life and property is stringent building codes and preservations of mangrove swamps and the elimination of the federal floodplain insurance. The photograph shows a home that was designed so that if the first floor gives way to the storm surge or floodwaters, the second and third floors are still supported by wooden beams driven deep into the sand. So if you look at long range forecasting of Atlantic hurricanes, since the early 1980s, Professor Gip Gray and his colleagues at Colorado State University have issued seasonal hurricane activity forecasts for the Atlantic Basin. The first forecast issued six months before the hurricane season and then updates are made. The original basis for the forecast was apparent linkage between the frequency of hurricanes in the tropical Atlantic and rainfall in the West Africa. They also factored in stratospheric quasi biennial oscillation. 
After this scheme didn't work well for several years, and after giving skillful re after giving skillful results, they developed a new one based on empirical relationships between the Atlantic Basin hurricane activity and the combination of atmospheric factors in various parts of the world. So in order to improve skill, a modified statistical forecast scheme was recently developed using data from 1950 to 2007, and it was first implemented in December of 2007. So NOAA has also issued a seasonal outlook for the Atlantic Basin hurricane activity since about 1998. And this gives probabilities of overall seasonal activity compared to the, to the normal and likely ranges of named tropical cyclones, hurricanes, and major hurricanes. We also had Project Storm Fury, and this was spurred by six destructive hurricanes that affected the U.S. coast during the mid-1950s. And the working hypothesis was that seeding hurricanes with silver iodine crystals would reduce the wind strength. This was supposed to increase the latent heat and enhance convection just beyond the eye wall. And a new eye wall would then form further out and the hurricane's circulation would theoretically weaken. At first there seemed to be a modest success, but this was dismissed because the convective clouds in the hurricanes were found to have too little supercooled water for the seeding to be to actually be effective. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this chapter, and thank you for your time.